Hello everyone. Welcome to the session, Using Unitime to Rebuild Schedules, PG due to the pandemic. The presenter is Tomas Wheeler. Please leave yourselves muted and cameras turned off during the presentation. If you would like to ask a question, wait until the Q&A portion after the presentation or use the shared notes to the left above the user list to ask the presenter questions. Please use the chat box only for chat, not questions to the presenter. If you have any technical issues, please send me, Stephanie Schlettenhofer, a direct message and we can assist you in any way we can. All right. You're on, Tomas. Okay, hello. I hope you can hear me. And just, okay. You should also see the, the presentation now. So my name is Tomáš, uh, and this will be a presentation about the scheduling system Unitime and how it can, it can be used to make schedule changes. So first, I would like to present uh, just a brief introduction of Unitime. For more details, please see us at the, the one of the expo sessions or see our video. Unitime is a comprehensive academic scheduling solution. It has five components, course timetabling, examination timetabling, student scheduling, instructor scheduling, and event management. Unitime is open source and it is part of the Apereo family since 2015. It is web-based, written in Java using modern technologies like Hibernate, Spring, frame, frame, Spring Framework, or Google Web Toolkit. We use state-of-the-art optimization algorithms and we have published a number of research papers about them. We have also co-organized a course timetabling competition recently. Unitime allows for multiple users with various roles. For instance, all the data can be distributed to individual timetabling units with the timetabling either done centrally or by each of the departments. Today, I will not be talking about uh, how Unitime can be used to build various schedules, but how to make changes to these schedules. I will start with a bit of theory and follow up with a case study from Purdue University where the fall 2020 course timetable and student schedules have to be rebuilt due to the COVID pandemic. I would also like you like to invite you to come see us at one of the expo sessions where I can do a short demo of how the, uh, how the changes can be made using unit time. First of all, I will be talking about making small changes. In particular, uh, once a course timetable is created by running the solver, which takes into account all the timetabling constraints and preferences on times, rooms, and students, we can use the suggestions page to make adjustments. In this mode, all the decisions are left on the operator, but we still make use of the timetabling solver to, to check for conflicts and provide suggestions on how to resolve these conflicts. This page can be used by just clicking at, any, at, at a class anywhere on, on the pages under the course timetabling menu. It is also useful to figure out why the solver cannot assign all classes if the problem is over constrained. It can be also used in a combination with what we call an interactive mode of the solver, where the operator is allowed to break some hard constraints without the need to go back and change the requirements in the input data. On the small screen on the right side, you can see how the page looks like. Once I can try to scroll in, once uh, one, one can either try to manually select a, uh, a different time or room where it uh, will show what other classes would, would conflict with the assignments, or it or the page also provides suggestions how to resolve these, these, these conflicts. It also provides suggestions on how, uh, excuse me. It is also pro, uh, possible to just look at the suggestions and use the filter to find the change uh, that would work the best. Another case how small changes can be done in unit time is by using the class assignment page. This is useful when you do not want to run the solver anymore. For example, when the class schedule have been already published and there 
are students enrolling in classes. It is perfect to make small adjustments directly to the current schedule. For example, if I need to move a class to a bigger room or add an additional section to one of the available times and rooms. Since we are no longer running the solar, there are no suggestions, but unit time still checks for conflicts. This page also allows to break any of the constraints and even move a class into a room that is not currently available to the department. The class assignment page, just like the suggestions page, allows to explore a change of multiple classes before any of the changes are actually made. You can see some of that on the page. Well, yeah, I'm failing to, 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 to zoom in properly. So like if I try to select a, a class to, to move it to a different time in the same room, it shows me that there are some other classes that, that are in a conflict and I would have to, I can, I have the possibility to also make, make the changes to, to these classes or just leave them unassigned and get back to them in a next step. Now let's talk about large changes. For these, we can run the solver in what we call an MPP mode. The MPP stands for minimal perturbation problem and it tries to find a new solution that is as close as possible to the original solution that for instance has been already published. This is also very useful for doing various simulations and, and what if scenarios. So here is a brief description of we, what we mean by the minimal perturbation problem. We have input data, which is typically uh, the previous already published solution, for instance, a class schedule. Next to the schedule, we have modified the input data. For instance, in case of the pandemic, we needed to change the capacity of the rooms to improve social distancing, distancing or make some classes online. The input data changes are usually breaking the previous solution, like a class can no longer be placed in, a, in, in, in its room because the room is now way too small. So the solution of this MPP problem is a new schedule, which solves the modified problem. The aim is for the new solution to minimize changes with the initial already published solution. We can also consider some changes as not allowed or with different penalizations. For example, we may prohibit or extremely penalize time changes while the room changes are still okay. In the end, the optimization has two components. The preferences and, excuse me, and, and requirements given by the problem, just like when the solver is run usually, plus there is a perturbation penalty component that measures and tries to minimize changes to the initial solution. So that has been for the, for the theory. Now let's take a look at the case study from Purdue University. I would like to start with a brief explanation how the course timetabling and student scheduling works at a normal year. We usually take the previous last year data and use the last year's student course enrollments to minimize student conflicts. The course timetabling happens in, in a few stages. First of all, the class schedule for large lecture rooms and large active learning rooms gets done centrally. It is about a thousand of classes that need to need one of the large rooms at, at the campus. Next, second, each department, and there are about 70 departments at Purdue University, builds its own timetable using the rooms they have been allocated to them. If some department has more classes that they have space, they can pass some of their classes to the so-called need room problem, and these overflow departmental classes are timetabled centrally after all the individual departmental schedules are done. And finally, we build the, the class schedule for computing labs. The whole process takes about a month and the final class schedule for fall term is published somewhere like first week of March. Once the class schedule is published, we have students registered to the classes they need. In fall, we need to distinguish between two populations of students. We have continuing students which need to have their class schedule around the end of the spring term and we have incoming students that are admitted in May and get their schedules in July, just a few weeks before classes start. For fall 2020 continuing students, we were in a process of introducing pre-registration. So we had about 6,000 students of continuing students that pre-registered for, for courses they needed and we used the unit time student scheduling solver to build their sched class schedules somewhere in, in mid-April. The rest of the students register for their classes directly. 
So <laughs> for the spring 2020, the pandemic hit in the middle of the term. So all classes just become online following the original schedule for, for that time. So we actually did not do any, any rescheduling for, for spring 2020. However, for fall 2020, the pandemic hit around the time when the class schedules were already published and the continuing students or most of the continuing students already had their class schedules. So after a, a, a long discussions, for fall, it was decided that Purdue will still offer some face-to-face -face classes, but with reduced capacity and a lot of safety rules like regular testing, contact tracing, mask mandates, and so on. The room capacities were reduced to about 50% with the cap of 150 students in a room. We gave the students a choice to come to campus and have some face-to-face -face classes or stay at home and, a, and get a fully online schedules. We also have international students from around the world, and some of them were not allowed to come to US. So a lot of courses had to offer sections that were taught asynchronously, not requiring the students to be available for an online meeting at a certain time. So for fall 2020 course timetabling, the schedule has, has to be rebuilt. It was decided that we would like to keep the existing times as much as possible. However, for each class, there would be a choice. Some classes are taught online, so they do not need any room any long, uh, anymore. Some classes are fully face-to-face, -face, so they need a bigger room, or we may need to add a few more sections. In the brackets next to each line, there is some, some estimate numbers of, of classes that actually fall into that category. And some classes are essentially left in the same time and room, but only a certain number of students would be able to attend face-to-face. -face. So for instance, imagine that there is a Monday, Wednesday, Friday class, and we can have just like one third of the students attending the class in person on Mondays, another third on Wednesdays, and the last third on Fridays, with the rest of the students attending the class online. There were also additional rooms allocated for timetabling, like some conference rooms, university reserve rooms, or rooms that were originally planned to be taken offline for, for maintenance for the term. We have used the MPP solver to first run some simulations to ascertain how many rooms will be needed and or how many classes can be done face to face. We have also run the MPP solver to move classes to different rooms. This was done centrally with the input from individual departments on what they want to do with each course, given the options that I have mentioned earlier. Also, there were additional courses offered fully online. Here is an example of English 106 OL as an online-only alternative to English 106. These OL courses were only available to students that did not come to campus. For student scheduling, we needed to rebuild class schedules for a lot of students. We have decided to use batch scheduling for that. For continuing students that, that, that were already enrolled in one or more courses that needed to be changed in a way that prevented the students to just stay in the sections they were in before, we have dropped them from the courses and created pre-registrations for them to get the courses back, preferring the sections they were originally in. These students were not able to make schedule changes after till, till after like mid-July when the whole course timetable and student schedules were, were done. For the incoming students, the, the day on campus where the students come in, we call it the STAR Student Transition Advising and Registration Program that was done completely online. And the students registered essentially as usually based on whether they indicated that they will come on campus or not come to campus. So essentially when they decided they will not come to campus, they they're only allowed to take the OL, the online only courses. When they come to campus, they pick up the, the regular residential courses. For students and the, that uh, decided to be off campus, and this could be the in, some of the incoming students, but also some of the continuing students, the students pre-registered together with the incoming students, but only for using these OL online only courses. All these students were batched together in mid-July using the Unitime Student Scheduling Solver and they were allowed to make changes to their schedules only after, after this was done. So they had a couple of weeks before the classes started to make some adjustments if they needed to.
Here are some results for the fall 2020 students rescheduling. We have run the student scheduling for close to 25,000 of students. 15,000 students were students that only needed to be rescheduled in one or more of their courses due to the course timetabling changes. This is the continuing residential students. Then there were about 3,700 of students that did not come to, to campus, both continuing online and, and incoming online students. And finally, there were about 8,000 of incoming students that have chosen to, to come to campus. Overall, we were able to give the, uh, these students about 95 to 99% of the courses they requested and almost all of those that were marked as critical in their degree plans. The table also shows how good the solver was in trying to satisfy students' preferences. For the continuing students, the preferences were actually based on the, their original enrollment, so we were able to satisfy most of these. For the online students, that hasn't really been that, that many of choice, so a lot of the preferences, yeah, they, they, they didn't get that much choice, so, so we just gave them the, the course that they preferred or the section that they, they preferred. For the incoming students, the, the number is, is, is a little lower. Uh, finally, there is also a percentage of residential students that did not get any face-to-face -face classes, which fortunately was very small, or that got less than half of their classes face-to-face. -face. Yeah, I would also like to mention that for the continuing residential students, on average, 1.8 courses of the, that they had in the schedule, so from average like 5.5 5, 5, 5, 5, 5 courses, their courses that they were rebatched to. So most of their schedule just stay as it is. And there have been a couple of changes for essentially each of these students. Uh, there were additional challenges to this process. We had to make various improvements to unit time, mostly to help the automation of the process, but also to allow for the course timetabling solver to run in the MPP mode, where the, the times were only allowed to, to, be, to be changed for, for classes that were newly added. So all the existing classes had to absolutely stay in the times that or were already in their schedules, and we were just moving the, the rooms around. Similarly, for the batch scheduling of continuing students, we had to make sure that for those students we were rebatching, that the, the other courses on their schedules, that they, they, they stayed fixed. There, were, uh, there was also a class attendance program written uh, at Purdue, helping with the contact tracing and attendance of those classes, which only allowed some students to attend each morning. So it was on the instructors to decide, OK, this set of the students will come on Mondays, this set of the students will come on Wednesdays, and this set of the students come, come on, on Fridays. And they had, it was up to them to decide how, how to split the students within the, the, the meetings they had. We have also helped uh, a bit with the so-called course modality reporting, tracking how many courses or classes are being offered in the face-to-face -face or, face or online mode. This was actually quite important as we needed to make sure that for the students that come to campus, they have at least some face-to-face -face classes and preferably at least half of their schedules face-to-face -face because why, why they would come to campus to not, not have any face-to-face any -face classes. For the last two slides, I have also a few notes about the following terms and the so-called getting back to normal. For spring 2021, the timetabling and student scheduling use the same policies as for, for fall 2020, but the process was way easier since the timetabling and student schedules were built from the start with these policy, policies in mind. There was also more focus in making sure that each department offers enough face-to-face -face classes and excuse me, the course timetabling for all the classrooms on, on campus was done centrally. We also had first time ever at Purdue, all the undergraduate students pre-registered and they got their initial schedules based on the, their pre-registration built using the unit times based student scheduling solver. This provided some additional challenges as there were over 31,000 of students that, that were pre-registered and had to be batched. And that's, uh, that's, that's a huge optimization problem. We have also added the prioritizations, giving more priority to athletes and other priority students than the students that are about to graduate and, and senior students. For fall 2021, we are back to normal in the terms of policies. 
the room capacities are back and there are no off-campus students. There are, however, still quite a lot of courses being offered online or with some online components to them. Also, the course timetabling still was done centrally for all classes needing a classroom and all the undergraduate students did pre-register and have, have been badged. We all are currently in the pre-registration of incoming students we, where we are looking at an unusually large incoming class that brings additional challenges to the process. So, the, okay, I have the, the last slide here. <laughs> here are some results from the student scheduling of spring 2021. This is that I've mentioned close to 31,000 of students and the tables is actually, they are split two ways. It's split by, by whether they come to, they came to campus or were online or by their priorities. So the priority students, then graduating students, students that had 100 or more credits already, senior students that had less than 100, but more than 60 or 60 or more, and, and the remaining students. We have been able, out of these, give over 20, uh, 96 of the courses that these students requested. And you can see that the priority students they got, got a little better. In most cases, students got did not get courses because there were no space available. So yeah, a lot of the stuff is up, up to the limit. But for the critical courses, for the courses that are marked as critical in their degree plans, yeah, those we were able to give all of them. For the, the preferences, yeah, the overall numbers are a little better, but it's mostly because we were able to, to build all of them together. And you can also see for the residential students how many of, of the students did, did not get any face-to-face -face classes or did get less than half of their schedules face-to-face. -face. Thank you. Before we start with the questions, I would like to know that you can come see us at one of the expo sessions uh, and that there will be one more presentation about unit time. I think it's on Wednesday about the APIs. So are there any questions? I don't see anything in the shared notes, I think. I'm not currently seeing any questions either. So I guess we will just go ahead and wrap this up if no one has any questions and mm -hmm. Get the room prepared for the next presenter. Thank you all for attending. Yeah, thank you.